this is natural for me because I think it's something um, I was struggling to convey before in still images that uh, the tools I've been developing for me interaction is absolutely essential um, interactivity and um, playfulness um, because for me uh, in early design exploration I think is best if it involves an element of play uh, if you want to be able to explore different ideas. Um, so this this uh, physics engine and relaxation software that I developed, I talked before about the challenge of simulating things like origami. Um, and after a few years of developing kangaroo, eventually I got to the point where I could simulate these things that I'd been modeling by hand. And the, so just to talk a little bit about where these ideas come from and the, the name. So dynamic relaxation, I think the term was first used in this article by Alistair Day. Um, and actually there he was talking about uh, using um, energy minimization to do static analysis. So not necessarily uh, just for form finding, but the idea being that you can, um, you can take some structure and uh, deform it, and then the potential energy stored gets converted into kinetic energy. It moves, it passes usually through equilibrium and bounces back and oscillates. You apply some damping, and eventually you get to uh, a minimum of your function. And this is really the central idea in all of kangaroo, and it's, uh, it then becomes all about uh, how you're defining these energies that you want to minimize. And for a, a spring, for a, a 1D element, it's uh, the energy, we're taking it as proportional um, to the, the square of the, the amount we're deforming it by. Uh, and that's something which is relatively easy to minimize and can also correspond to actual elastic properties. Um, so if you define these energies in the right way, um, for example, the, the model for the beam bending or the um, spline bending in kangaroo comes from this paper by Adrinson and Barnes. And if you build up the energy in this way, then actually when you minimize it, you'll get uh, a correct elastic curve for a for a thin rod. Um, and that was actually the, the real starting point. Um, it was seeing an example piece of code by Chris um, that inspired the whole of Kangaroo. Um, but uh, I want to talk also a little bit about games and game physics, because I mentioned interactivity and play. And I've also been inspired a lot by looking at uh, how game programmers do their physics. And um, a few years ago, after studying on kangaroo and doing it with these forces and accelerations, I was finding that uh, there was sometimes an issue with numerical stability. And uh, if I didn't use a small enough time step, things were exploding. And in games, they often um, use a technique where they project constraints, and they project them sequentially. So and the, the classic paper. Um, by Thomas Jackson, uh, and it was the application was ragdoll physics. So they're making characters fall downstairs without their arms stretching too much. And what they do is they project each constraint one at a time. So they'll project one limb, and then they'll project the other limb, and they'll just run through a few cycles of that. And eventually, um, if it's possible to satisfy the constraints, you'll reach that. And this can be seen as a method of alternating projections. So what they're doing is satisfy one constraint, satisfy another constraint, probably violating the first one. But if there is an intersection between them, um, and they're convex, then you'll hopefully find your way to it or close enough to it in a reasonable time step. And for physics, that it's uh, sorry for game physics, all they usually care about is um, plausible uh, realism. So actually, the fact that they might not reach all the way. They've only got a few milliseconds in the game pipeline 
to, to satisfy the constraints, and they might not fully satisfy it, and it might be a bit soft, and that's good enough for them. Whereas if we want to use it for engineering applications, we need to be able to say in a quantitative way how much we're satisfying each constraint. And that's where this idea of average projections comes in. Um, I was first introduced to this idea through conversations with um, Mark Pauly's group at DPFL. Um, and they did a paper called Shape Op, um, where they used these ideas. Um, and essentially, you project to all your constraints at once and then recombine them. Um, and one big advantage of this compared to the alternating method is that if your constraint sets don't overlap, um, with the alternating projection method, you just jump back and forth between them. You satisfy one and then the other, but neither a compromise between the two. Whereas with average projections, you can actually set up conflicting constraints and minimize uh, the sum of your squared errors in a meaningful way. So just uh, essentially the loop that it's following, you satisfy each of the constraints or goals. So in Kangaroo, I tend to switch back and forth between energies and constraints and goals fairly interchangeably, and that's because I'm using the same system for, for all of them. So minimizing an energy or satisfying a constraint and that can include constraints which you need to be um, satisfied exactly. So if you set up a consistent system of constraints, then it should find something that satisfies them exactly. But you can also set up um, conflicting ones, in which case you minimize this sum of squared errors, as I mentioned. So you, you satisfy the goals, then you, which means a point might try and move in 10 different directions at once, and then you recombine them with this averaging operation and repeat. Um, it turns out this method is not new. I only learned of this uh, much later, and I think this uh, predates the, uh, the work by EPFL as well. As, um, so this is, uh, in physics, there was uh, an approach called divide and concur, um, where they, essentially, it's this same method of um, just alternating back and forth between the two, which is part of a a more general class of algorithms, and then it's alternating direction method of multipliers, apparently. Um, one thing which is a little different um, in Kangaroo from just that simple averaging I mentioned before is uh, you've got scalar weights. So for each of the, the goals or forces acting on it, um, you can uh, specify its relative importance to the others in a quantitatively meaningful way. Um, so rather than uh, just going to halfway between two points, you could actually say one is twice as important as the other. Um, and the difference compared to the force-based method is that you don't overshoot. Because um, before, with forces, if you wanted to make something very important, you'd pull it with a very strong force, which meant you had to then use a very small time step. So the, the outcome of all this is you can get quantitatively, quantitatively meaningful deformations, um, and, um, but still with uh, pretty good speed and good flexibility in terms of creating new goals. So this is a, this is a project by a friend, uh, Gregory Quinn, um, which was using, so it's using the kangaroo engine to simulate um, deformation of some elastic rods with various constraints, and uh, you have a board with pins, and you can you, you have a set of modeling uh, pieces where you can build a real physical model, and it overlays your um, digital model on that, so you can start seeing bending moments, and it's tracking that marker, so that funny symbol is letting the camera see where you're pushing it. Um, so he's using that as a, as a learning tool for teaching engineers about forces. Um, so one other way in which the algorithm in Kangaroo is a little bit different from um, maybe what we think of as the classic form of dynamic relaxation is in the, the form of damping used. So the um, simplest form and the one I started with is viscous damping, where actually you just take a little bit of energy out of the system at each step, just multiply the speed by 0.99. Um, that gets you there. But the issue is um, 
It's not necessarily the most efficient way, and finding out how much damping to apply isn't always that easy. Um, another method which is sometimes used is kinetic damping, where you monitor the uh, overall kinetic energy of this, the system, and when you detect peaks, you just stop everything, freeze everything, and restart it. And that, that's um, related to this idea that if it's a simple pendulum, then it's moving fastest at the bottom. So if you stop it there, you've already solved the system. Now, for bigger systems, you might have it's more complex than just one oscillation. But uh, the idea is that the, the big frequencies get taken out, and um, it should converge quicker than the, the viscous mode. Um, then the um, so the form of damping that I adopted in the when I so I rewrote kangaroo at some point. I developed it for a few years, um, then was finding these issues with stability, and actually uh, scrapped it and rewrote the whole system from scratch. And in the new solver, I adopted um, something called drift damping. Um, and the idea from this came from a paper called. Uh, um, which I'll, I'll show the reference in a second, a paper by Masaki Miki. And um, the, the, the main idea here is that you, you monitor the angle between the velocity and the acceleration. Um, so you've got velocity in blue there, acceleration in red. And there's a point where that angle um, crosses 90 degrees, and it happens at the bottom of the swing. And so that means the projection of the red arrow onto the blue arrow becomes negative. And what I do is monitor this angle for every single particle in the system, and per particle decide whether to damp it based on whether or not this angle is negative. Um, one advantage this seems to have over the, the kinetic damping is that you don't freeze the whole system all at once. You can actually, as one particle starts uh, overshooting, then that one gets slowed down. Um, so this is the, it's from this paper, the ED6 dynamic relaxation method, um, slightly modified. So in, in the paper, they use um, just a, a gradually uh, increasing damping with that angle. So sorry, on the horizontal axis there is that angle between acceleration and velocity. And one is no damping. So um, the more negative that angle gets, the more you damp it, whereas I found those getting better results with just having a simple step function. So no damping at all. Um, and intuitively, this means like the pendulum is swinging, and you don't do anything to slow it down. Whereas in viscous damping, one disadvantage is you're always slowing down everything, even when, you, even when it's moving in the right direction. This says, if it's going in the right direction, great. As soon as it's overshot and it's being pulled back, then you damp it really strongly. Um, so the, the difference, just to compare, um, this is how it was in the old solver um, with the same stiffness and um, material properties. And now, uh, blink and you'll miss it. So that's uh, switching now to the new solver. And when I run that, that it's converged. So it, it switched to something that was um, where you could converge for small systems effectively instantaneously for for design purposes. <laughs> and that opened up a whole new way of working where you could work with constraints. And that's why I say I talk about constraints and energies in the same way. Because normally, I think most uh, geometric sketch constraint solvers solve the constraints in quite a different way. <laughs> so I'll just pause that second. Um, but here, it's just one framework the relaxation is doing. Uh, all of this, whether it's physical simulation, constraint solving. And because it's such a flexible system, you don't need to specify a lot of information to create a new goal. You can do things like here, um, fixing the areas of these regions. So it's a sort of a bit like a pressure for each polyline. So you can interactively move around the points, and you see it's adjusting to maintain those uh, the areas in that floor plan. Or in, in 3D, you can set up constraints. So here, I've got uh, the tops of those columns are all coplanar. Uh, there's uh, right angle constraints on some of the edges. Yep. So you can, um, 
yeah, builds uh, geometry with these kind of constraints built in. Um, or <coughs> translation um, mirroring constraints. So here we've got some points which are locked to always maintain the same position uh, relative to another point given some transformation scaling one. Um, so going on from this and tying into this idea of um, intuition and play, I think an important role of uh, play for children is uh, developing an intuition about the physical world. You, they stack blocks and figure out how things behave under gravity. And the idea of um, making this very interactive was that people could, um, could quickly play with it and get very fast feedback. And I studied, but then going beyond just uh, simulating physical behavior, what if you define some fictional physical behavior? In this case, I have um, a grid of triangles with some irregular vertices, and there's some smoothing, and there's a constraint, a global edge length constraint, and then also a constraint for each triangle trying to make its edges equal. And you can trade those, uh, those forces off against each other. So you see around the, uh, the valence 7 point, you're getting some negative curvature. Um, around the valence 5, a bit of positive curvature. Um, but it's staying overall fairly smooth. And then if you adjust these values, um, so here the, there's a fairly even balance between these forces. Um, but obviously, the triangles can't be perfectly equilateral here, because um, otherwise you wouldn't have that smooth curvature. Whereas if you do up the relative weighting, the, the equilateralization force, um, if you keep increasing it enough and eventually just get rid of all the smoothing, then you end up with uh, a surface where the edge lengths are all the same, but you get something crumpled. So this idea that you can define these kind of custom physical properties became quite an important thing for For this development. Um, so this is coming back to this idea of planar panels. So defining a freeform building, and uh, the color here is showing how far out of plane each one of these quads is. And this is very much tied to how you distribute your initial grid and uh, what forms you pull it into. And I say that with this, you can, uh, you can <coughs> move it around and see the results. So rather than trying to post-rationalize it, rather than defining some completely arbitrary freeform, and then really struggling to figure out how to fit a grid on it so the panels can be planar. You, um, you put the panelization in before you even fully define the form. So now that's all flat and cooked up. Um, another fabrication constraint um, beyond the panels, but if we're looking at the actual beam structure. So again, thinking of some large freeform roof with quad panels. Um, one issue that often comes up is if you just map a, a quad grid onto a curved surface and then at each node extrude normal to the surface and connect those two normals along each of the edges, you get something like the image on the right where each one of the beams is twisted. Um, now you could fabricate twisted beams, which I guess is kind of what they did in the Pompidou Metz uh, example this morning, um, where you have very complex pieces. Um, or you could do the option on the left, where you have flat beams and you have a very complicated node to resolve that twist there. And you'll see lots of buildings um, have, uh, Parliament House actually has a, a hugely complex steel node there, each one custom um, to resolve these twists. Um, but. Uh, the work of uh, Helmut Potman's group, um, he's actually done a lot um, drawing on um, some other work from Berlin. Um, has, uh, they describe a condition uh, for the angles around the vertex, um, which if you satisfy this constraint where the sums of pairs of opposite angles around each vertex in a quad mesh are equal. Um, then what happens is you can then offset it and have a perfectly clean intersection. So you can do this um, on curved surfaces. Your beams are flat, 
and they all intersect in a single line. So that's obviously it's much simpler to make a, a node that only has to uh, negotiate angles in plane rather than a whole system of twists. So um, another another really nice energy uh, I found um, it's based on some work by Stefan Zeppelman. Um, he described an energy which can be used to make sure that the every quad in the grid has a in-circle and moreover that every pair of adjacent quads those in-circles touch. Um, and one thing that's really nice about this when you apply it on curved surfaces is that if you get the irregular vertices in the right place it will tend to slide around and find its own alignment to the principal curvatures. Um, so um, if, if you have a big patch of your surface and it's got room to slide around, you can just drop project a quad mesh onto it and apply this constraint and it will they'll shrink. And they, the quads keep fairly square. You don't end up with, with rectangles with this method. Um, so this was just an energy. I, I saw the paper at a AAG conference a few years ago. I thought it was really nice. They described this reasonably simple energy for a condition on those four angles. And I was able to to write that as a new goal in kangaroo. And I'll show in a moment uh, an example of actually what that involves. Um, but uh, still on this topic of circle packing, um, this is uh, an NG for making tangent circles on triangular meshes. And also coupling it here, you see, with some remeshing, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment. Um, so this energy, again, is making sure, um, it's actually making sure you have uh, touching tangent in circles to triangles. Um, this is a different approach to circle packing, which I'll skip over. This is a more physics-based approach. And um, well, you see the difference here. It's not such a nice circle packing because you have lots of gaps with more than three sides. So it's not a, a compact circle packing. And um, so this one area of application completely outside architecture is people do these pave designs for jewelry where they want to pack lots of uh, stones of a certain size on curved surfaces. Um, but the, so the energy here is actually, it's, it's a really nice paper and a, a very simple energy they describe. Um, so if you have these, this condition just on the lengths, so the, the sums of pairs of opposite uh, edges, lengths, uh, should be equal. That gives you a, the in-circles of each triangle touch. And that means, at least in the plane, you can draw a circle through those points of tangency and that gives you a circle packing. Um, on a curved surface, it's not actually a strict circle packing. It's a, you have spheres um, that are tangent at those points. But if your surface is fairly smooth, it can be, they can be fairly close to flat circles. Um, and as, again, it gives you these um, what are sometimes called torsion-free beam layouts, um, where if you take the normal to each circle um, in each triangle, obviously those have to be in the same plane because the, the points of tangency touch. So that means you can, again, make your structures out of flat beams. So um, this is uh, the actual application of that in the code. Um, and this is maybe just to connect slightly with uh, so the conversation before lunch of like these tools, um, they don't always do exactly what you want. And I think it's important to allow some degree of customization um, so I've opened up um, the interface so people can create their own energies and plug them into this same minimization framework. So in this case, um, if someone wants to take the result from that paper, that's uh, that condition on the lengths, all you really need to do um, is figure out for every particle or every point that a goal is acting on, what vector do you want to move it by? And that's all the solver needs um, to know to minimize it. So you say, where would you have to move it to to make the energy zero? Um, and then it, you can start combining it with all your other goals. Um, in fact, actually, you don't, 
necessarily need to know exactly where to go to make it zero. You only need to know if you're moving if you're moving in the right direction. Um, you you can also just have something which takes you a small step in the right direction, um, and it might not converge as quickly, but um, you should still be able to get there. So that's this goal in operation, um, satisfying this constraint on all adjacent pairs of triangles, uh, coupled with, I think, some other goals for the, the edge length or the smoothness. So, um, yeah, I got really into circle backings, um, just some exploration with that. This is um, with applying some Mobius transformations to these circle packings. It's really nice that uh, it, once you've got the connectivity of a mesh, um, if you keep it tangent to a circle, an exterior circle, it's, it's unique up to Mobius transformations. So these are um, applying different Mobius transformations to the same circle packing, keeping them tangent, or uh, in this case, some Steiner chains of circles. Um, in terms of actual another application of this, there's also a really nice application to conformal mapping. So if you um, if you find a circle packing in some arbitrary boundary shape, and then you find a circle packing with the same connectivity in a different boundary shape, you've got a conformal map between the two. So this and this works on curved surfaces as well. So you can use this for applying patterns or textures. Um, to curved surfaces if you want to map a grid onto them. They're all using this, this circle packing energy I just, just showed. Um, another really nice application is um, there's some work on uh, deployable structures. I don't know if you've seen the work of Chuck Hoberman. You've probably seen the expanding sphere toy. And um, actually, the constraint there that allows these angulated scissor linkages to work um, is closely related to circle packing. So there's this nice paper that um, used Kangaroo to find some circle packings and um, then uh, created these, these linkages uh, so that the system can expand and contract as a whole. So coming back to um, membrane structures a bit, um, something um, I think I touched on it just briefly before. Um, this actually isn't a minimal surface. Um, and the, the way usually people were using Kangaroo before to model these uh, stretch fabrics is making a mesh and treating every edge of the mesh as a, um, a spring with zero rest length. And that gives you something which is all intention, but not necessarily a minimal surface. And that's because. Uh, it depends really on your meshing. So if I, do, if I treat each of these edges as a zero rest length spring, but I've got a denser mesh on one side, it's going to affect the shape because um, where the edges are more bunched up, it's, uh, it's obviously got more force. So it's not properly derived from the area. Um, so there is a correct way to do that if you're trying to minimize area. Um, this was an interesting. I won, um, so when I was reading about this and trying to find the right way to do it, um, it seems that people talk about this in very different ways in different disciplines. Uh, and this is something I keep coming up against is that because I'm looking at papers in um, computer graphics and also in engineering, often they talk about the same thing in such different ways that it's not always easy to recognize them. Um, but. Uh, Actually, uh, I've had a very helpful conversation, I think, with um, Paul Richards from Bath, oh, sorry, Paul Shepard, um, about um, minimizing triangle areas. And the way he explained it suddenly made it seem much more intuitive to me is that if you want to minimize the area of a triangle, if you move the point, so that top point, if you move it along the gray line, obviously that's not going to change the area. Um, the most direct way to change the area is to move perpendicular to the opposite edge. So you can define an energy. Um, and the amount it's going to reduce the area by is proportional to the length of the edge you're moving it towards. Um, so you can define a very simple energy for area minimization based on that. And you get exactly the same vectors you do from using the, the cotangent Laplacian formula. Um, so applying this to 
to mesh relaxation now, um, so based on area elements and not on lines, I uh, started running into some other interesting effects. This is also combining with remeshing. And what you sometimes find is just like real soap films, they can sometimes collapse. Unlike real soap films, you can, well, maybe you can do this with a real soap film, but uh, you can reconnect them. So it's never actually, it doesn't change the genus of the surface, it changes the internal connectivity of it in order to maintain good triangle qualities. So this is um, using this local remeshing approach where for each edge, you look at its properties and decide whether you want to apply some operation to it. You can either flip it to, um, to make the angles better. I realize now looking at this diagram, it's, I'm actually making the angles worse in this example, but um, if you want, you want to try and keep each triangle as close to equilateral as possible, so you can flip the edges. If it's too long, you can split it. Um, or if it's too short, you can collapse it. And by applying these, these operations, you can keep a fairly good distribution of your points and faces over the surface. Um, so this, this was my attempt at the, uh, the Fry Otto eye example. Um, is this applying remeshing? I guess that the string collapsing is maybe where the infinite curvature bit. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's been, I think it, it makes a, a really fun design tool because uh, while the genus is fixed, you can actually change the topology of the bound, the, like you can link boundaries that weren't linked before and have the surface keep updating. Um, so you can have very flexible topological play with the forms as you're designing them. Um, in a way that's difficult to do if you keep your mesh uh, fixed throughout. Uh, time. Uh, another thing uh, you can combine with this, so here I've got a, a pressure, um, or rather I'm fixing the volume. Uh, it's, uh, at first, it was a strange concept to me, the idea of defining a volume for an open surface. But it turns out the formula, so I'm calculating the volume using the um, forming a tetrahedron between every triangle and an arbitrary point, and summing up the sine volumes of those tetrahedra. So that way, um, you can define a volume, um, or like a difference in volume relative to your starting position and inflate the surface to get these uh, constant mean curvature surfaces. Uh, another interesting thing I've been encountering with these is that a lot of um, surfaces that I thought should be, I was familiar with from examples of minimal surfaces turn out not to be stable, and actually the slightest uh, imperfection or nudge, and they, they flip to a different configuration. So this helicoid, um, starting with a vertical axis, wants to to jump to a, a smaller area configuration where it jumps from, from one helix up to the next one. Um, and actually, someone sent me a paper on this saying, explaining how it's actually a, a function of the aspect ratio. So if you have a, if those helices are more vertical, there's a point at which the other configuration is stable. Um, or uh, Costa's minimal surface. I wanted to try and model, and it, this was something that was actually relatively easy to do before with just the springs, but when you do it properly with the area-based elements, it wants to collapse to something, something simpler. Um, another one that I found really fun was uh, this, so starting with the, the seafoot surface of a trefoil knot, and then um, pulling the edges of the knot around so that it's no longer a knot, but you're left with a, a surface which isn't a simple disk. Uh, and this is an interesting puzzle to figure out what the, what the topology of that surface you're left with is. Um, in terms of more practical um, things, aspects of, of membrane form funding, something um, that I'm working on incorporating into so I had it working before with the, um, the non-remeshing approach, but um, these geodesic strings, so you can uh, set one line of edges that tries to shorten 
without changing the shape of the surface, and you can use that to make sure that when you cut your strips of fabric, they lie, uh, they lie straight. Um, so back uh, to reciprocal structures, which um, I mentioned briefly before. And I've been really interested in different forms of reciprocals. And uh, uh, just to mention that in six minutes it will be two o'clock. OK. OK. I'll accelerate. OK. Um, so varying on graphic statics, there's a, um, a connection between each of the edges in the actual structure. And you can form closed polygons, um, making sure that it's in equilibrium. And also, so I've also been exploring some of these ideas uh, in this constraint system. So linking pairs of edges so you can modify uh, both the structure and it, the reciprocal force diagram. Um, and one thing that I found really interesting with uh, networks of zero rest length springs, because um, in the in graphic statics, the reciprocal, the lengths of the lines, um, the angles relative to the original the structure diagram are fixed, and their length is the force density, so the um, the force in the member times its length. But if you have zero rest length springs, then the length of the member is the is proportional to the force, um, which means that the lengths of the lines in the the structure and its reciprocal are the same, and you can slide smoothly between them. And this applies even in 3D. So this is actually, it's not a minimal surface, but because the triangles are fairly even, it will be close to it, um, made up of zero rest length lines. And um, you can then actually smoothly deform that to the reciprocal. And I think there's a connection here with the gauss bonnet transformations of minimal surfaces. Um, uh, how much time do I have? Um, auxetics, um, this is work on covering curved surfaces with uh, identical polygons. Obviously, it's impossible to cover a curved surface, to completely cover a curved surface with identical squares. But if you open up gaps between them, the idea being that maybe um, you can manufacture identical panels to cover most of the surface very cheaply and use some different technique to fill in the gaps. Um, this led to some collaboration uh, with EPFL again on applying these techniques to um, to curved surfaces, where you just start from a flat sheet with these these cuts in it and uh, figuring out what kind of surfaces you can stretch them over. Um, and they've actually been developing this further, not just to things that start out regular when they're flat, um, but actually adjusting so that it can own when it's uh, stretched, it forms, it predetermines the surface it deforms to. Um, I'll skip that, skip that. And with a little bit of, um, so this was um, inspired by, I saw this image from Richard Kenyon, a uh, mathematician that um, really inspired me. And I was interested, how could I recreate this? Um, with a possible view to um, connecting this with reciprocal structures. And I found that actually, from a circle packing, if you take those points of tangency, line through them, rotate them, you can form these grids of triangles that connect in this way. And this is, so often the way I work is geometric exploration and then uh, trying to find applications. I think this can connect to some structural applications, but it's something I'm still working on. Um, um, Why don't you continue yeah. I'm sorry, because yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. So I will stop there. Okay. Okay, so um, I was talking about uh, transformable structures and um, this construction where um, if you take the, the, the midpoints of the dual edges, uh, this is the, the circumcentric dual, um, then uh, you can rotate each of these triangles and make an expanding system. Um, 
But one of the challenges with these kind of systems is uh, taking them out of the plane. So this, uh, you see how the, the points of the red triangles don't coincide with the edges of the triangle. So this one wouldn't actually work in plane. Whereas uh, something like this, based on um, circular and conical meshes, um, would still allow you to expand keeping the shape. Um, so I was uh, talking about trying to uh, apply some of these ideas and uh, the square version. But I think I will really just wrap up. Um, oh, sorry, th there's a, a couple of words on this. Um, this, um, it took me a while to, to figure out the equivalent of the triangular version. And uh, eventually I found that uh, it was when the, the diagonals of the quad were equal in length and orthogonal to each other, um, which means that the, when you join the midpoints of the edges, it gives you a square. And also then you can uh, rotate these lines to get um, squares at different angles. So I made, again, an, an energy for this in Kangaroo to make squares that have this property of being equidiagonal and orthodiagonal. And this allows you to um, create these systems of rotating squares, which next step would be uh, to see how this can be extended onto curved surfaces. Um, but uh, really, to conclude, this is... Uh, a different kind of project this is going to play um, and for me um, one of the, the places that mathematics in architecture has been particularly interesting is the, the collaborations it's opened up so this is a project um, we had a, a PhD student co-supervised by Foster and Partners and the Royal Veterinary College and he was a specialist in bone adaptation and um, we worked together, this is actually some, um, we developed some software based on uh, ellipsoid packing, inspired by this, um, the capacity of bone to adapt its structure to um, increase its density in regions of higher stress and align with the stresses. So we, we worked from a stress analysis to, um, to size and orient ellipsoids as they moved through it and then formed a packing from these and used the connectivity of that for optimizing trusses. But what I find particularly nice about this is that mathematics has so often been the common ground that's connected us to other disciplines. And very often when researching some mathematical idea, it's an opportunity then you find that actually there are crystallographers looking at the same problem or uh, astrophysicists, or all, all different disciplines, and um, then mathematics is the, the common ground where you meet and uh, find things to discuss. Although this often comes with challenges that they, they talk about the mathematics often in very different uh, language, and it takes a little while to translate. Um, but it's why I think forums like this are a great opportunity to, to meet and discuss these things across disciplines. I look forward to hearing what the, uh, the next theme for the next one will be.